So I think we can all agree that Echo Golf Shoes changed the game when Fred Couples rolled up wearing them without socks. It, it, it spoke to their comfort and just sort of that that effortless cool. But you have an Arnold Palmer story I want to hear, right? Let, let's hear it, Mike. Have I ever told you about my last visit with Arnold? I, I saw Arnold. I would like to thank no reporters for Arnold more than I did uh, when he was in his 80s. My last visit with him was in La Trobe, and I drove there wearing these pathetic Birkenstocks. When I got, oh, I'll just wear my shoes when I get there. But when I got there, all I had was my Echo golf shoes, and Arnold's really formal. And I'm going into his office with my cleaned up Echo golf shoes. And Arnold's like checking me out and he's nodding. And I said, Arnold, are you looking at my socks? And he's, Arnold's like, no, I'm looking at your shoes. And then Arnold talked about all the different shoes he wore. And no question, Arnold dug the Echo shoe. I love the Echo shoe. I know you do too. Uh, it's a great shoe. If and I'm sales enough. resistant. <laughs> if it's good enough for Arnold Palmer and Fred Couples, it's good enough for the rest of you. So go to echo.com and um, you can find one that fits, that you like, that people will stare at, like Arnie. So back to Nita Forth. Jeff, may I call you Jeff? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> golf is the, the only thing in golf that doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the person playing. Is this man a one-time winner on the PGA Tour? The point, Alan, is he didn't go Hollywood. You need a fourth? This is fun. So let's say you're probably a better guitar player than I am a golfer. I think it's the reason so many athletes across sports think he's the greatest athlete they ever saw. I would go to the range and I would try to hit, you know, a couple of hundred one irons. And I would try to hit them as high and as hard as I could. Great athletes do leave legacies. I'm trying to think of the one I can share and not get myself in trouble. Oh my God, there's a dangerous group here. <laughs> Welcome back to Anita Fourth. This is Alan Shipnack. This is the podcast where myself, Michael Bamberger, and U.S. Open champion Jeff Ogilvie take turns surprising each other with mystery guests. Uh, today's is an active PGA Tour player. He's from the great state of Washington, not Fred Couples. Uh, he contended at this year's U.S. Open until the bitter end. Uh, unfortunately, we saw a little too much of him at this year's Phoenix Open. A little too much of him. Uh, <laughs> I'm making this easy, guys. He is uh, known for his fun, quirky chemistry with his longtime caddy. Uh, all right, forget it. Joel Damon, come on down. Show yourself. <laughs> What's happening? How we doing, guys? What's Hi, up? Joel. This is fun. So you, you look a little nervous. I can see you're scanning from face to face. On, I was on trying to the, figure the out. Yeah, this is uh, – Jeff, are you back in Australia? Back in Australia, yeah, yeah. Okay, I have no idea what time I'd be there, but uh, it's uh, it's in the morning. It's all good. Okay, nice. Tomorrow, yeah. it's like it's like time travel. And Michael, where are you? Joe, I'm in I'm in San Diego, and uh, I know you don't know me, but you you made a big impression on me the first time I saw you in person. It was at the Washington event, and it was the one that uh, that Molinari Molinari won. And uh, I was following you. I think I was drawn to the floppy hat. And there were, and I don't remember the ins and outs of it, but you got the red ass because there was a cheating thing going on, and you were going to get to the bottom of it. That's the headline, and I don't know the story behind it, but I remember being impressed. Uh, yeah, that that did happen. It was uh, I played with Tiger on Saturday, so it was already like the biggest moment of my career at the time. It's my second year on tour. Uh, I'm just trying to find my way, really. And then uh, Sunday happens uh, on the tenth hole, and uh, yeah, that that was. That was still probably the biggest point of my golf career. <laughs> Wait, does that come up? Do you guys talk about that with you? All the time. Oh, wow. I didn't uh, uh -huh. Like, uh, so Max Homa had his big baby shower last night. And so, you know, he's got a bunch of people over at his house. We're having a grand old time and it comes up. Uh, I mean, it is it is quite often. I actually caddied for Brandon Harkins three weeks ago now in, in uh, Boise at the Corn Ferry Finals event. So we're out playing a practice round. The pairings come out on Tuesday afternoon. We're paired with Sung Kang. No way. What are the odds of that? Like it's uh, 
the, the tour has really kept us separate. Uh, you know, we played out the same category for a while, never even like in the same morning and afternoon way. Like we were always opposite waves, not even close to each other. So we've only played together once since then. And it, it's been fine. Uh, we were, it wasn't like we were friends before. Uh, it's not like we ever, we didn't know who each other was really before. And uh, it's been fine afterwards. I, I raked his bunker and I cleaned his ball and uh, told him good shot. So it was all, it's all good. That's so commendable. I mean, that's one thing I wanted to ask you about was your experience caddying because uh, Brandon being one of your one of your great friends, it's it's a big moment in his career. Yeah. You have some know how, but uh, playing a caddying is not the same. So, what was the experience like being on the other side of the strap? Cat, yeah, caddying is so hard. One, um, I'm almost 35. I'm a professional athlete, is what you know. I guess technically, I'm a professional athlete. I'm supposed <laughs> to be in the prime of my career, and I. Uh, it's hard to carry that bag. Uh, you know, I, I had the full staff bag. It was as light as it could possibly be. Uh, and it was still, it was still tough, but, um, selfishly, I want to back on the PJ tour. Um, you know, he finished 26 in the regular season. I uh, just missed out. Uh, I'm actually going over to his house for dinner tonight. Uh, he just got back in. So, uh, we're, we're super close. And I was, you know, he called me Sunday night and he's like, Hey, can I, you know, can, 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 can I come up and caddy? And I said, yeah, sure. Um, anything I can do to help, but it's so hard to help in like a one week's time. It's like, you're not really gonna work on the golf swing. You're just trying to make him happy and stay out of his way really for the most part. But now we're in Boise. You're also at elevations. So we're playing five to 10% pinning on the heat. I haven't carried a book and done a yardage in five years. Gino's a great caddy. He takes care of all that stuff. So now he's relying on me to do the numbers. I am panicking about that. And you're always thinking about the next shot. Like, you know, where the pin is and all the slopes and everything you possibly do. And like, it's, it's, it's fast. It is really fast out there. And then you're trying to make sure you get the pin. You're just trying not to be in the way, trying to clean the ball. Like, uh, it was a, it was a new found respect again. I, I've, I've, I think I treat caddies pretty well. Obviously I have a great relationship with my, with, with Gino. He's my best friend, but I can still kind of be a butthead out there at times. And so, uh, I'm, I'm going to be a lot gentler to, uh, to, Gino going forward for sure. Do you think we'd all be better players if we had to caddy for someone once and once every now and then? I said that quote in an interview. I or in someone else. I said every good player should caddy one time for another good player um, in in a big event. I think it's so hard. And you know, does he want to hit a little pitching wedge or a big gap wedge? Like, what's he feeling? Keeping track of the wind. Like, then he calls you in for a read, and you're like, <laughs> do you like? he says it's a cup out and I'm only on the edge. Like, do I give him like a ball and a half to split the difference or do I really tell him what I feel? Uh, it is, it's, it's hard work and um, I'm glad I'm on the playing side of it for now, for sure. Did you carry the umbrella? No, uh, no umbrella. Uh, we carried like four balls in the bag. He actually didn't even put a water in the bag cause he would chug it on the tee box and throw it in the garbage. So I didn't have to carry an extra water. Like it was, it was pretty fun. <laughs> we didn't have anything extra in there. That is such an insightful uh, comment, Jeff, because in my experience, guys will carry the umbrella when there's a 0.0 chance of rain. Uh, so it depends on the boss. It does. It depends depend on, on the, boss. the boss. It's all about the player. Like if the, uh, if the boss is, um, is a tough one, you carry the umbrella 100% of the time. But most players, I think, leave their caddy. It's like your choice. But if we get stuck with that one, you're in, yeah. you're uh, in a bit of trouble. <laughs> it was at Congaree a couple years ago. Uh, JT Poston famously got caught in the rain. There was a 0% chance, and Aaron Fleener uh, did not have it, and he was soaking wet. And Fleener's, uh, he's one of my favorite people, but he's been known to maybe cut a corner or two out there, and uh, he's carried the umbrella every round since then. Joel, how, how can a caddy really read a green for a player when he can't really know how hard the player wants to strike the putt? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, let's say you're always trying to hit it 12 inches or 17 inch past the hole or somewhere in that range. Like, but sometimes you're going to hit it softer and sometimes you're going to hit it harder. And the player doesn't always know what they're going to do, to be honest. I mean, we, we try to do things, but uh, that, that part is really difficult. I think that comes with a lot of time. Like Gino knows the downhillers are going to be hit a lot softer, obviously, but he's, he's, we've been together for eight years. Like he can, that's when you have, you know, you can really, you know, kind of figure out what, what your player does and exactly, you know, what, what, what his t- tendencies are uh, as well. So um, for a one-off gig, I think he was just trying to have a buddy on the bag and help out. And unfortunately, we, we actually missed the cut by one, but um, that's how it goes. 
Is there one, is there one decision that, that you helped to make that you still regret? Two of them. <laughs> what, what's your... uh, we were, uh, first round we're on the, I guess it was our like 13th or 14th hole, but it, he has like a, he has a wedge to a back pin. If you go long, it's auto mm-hmm. bogey and could be double. And he wanted to chip a pitching wedge back there to skip it up the slope. And I'm like, if this flies a little too far, it's skipping to the back bunker. No chance. So I talk him into uh, his, his gap wedge, which was a perfect number, I thought. But he didn't. He wanted to make sure he got it on top. But it's a small little area. And he kind of goosed a little bit. And it one hopped over to the back bunker and plugged. And then he left that one in the bunker. And he got that one up and down, thankfully, for bogey. But there, I could have even like lied to him about a number at that point, give him three yards shorter to hit it into because you just know that long is so bad. So I should have probably just let him hit his pitching wedge and like skip it in there because that's what he kind of wanted. And I was protecting long. And um, and then in the second round, we're going for par five. And I said long was good to a back bunker. Like his three would go over, his two arm would kind of come up short. And I thought it was easier if he hit it over the green. So I kind of talked him into a three wood and it was not an easy bunker shot where if he would have hit his two iron short, he probably could have got it up and down. So those two I feel kind of crappy about. I talked him into we had to he had to make two birdies coming in the last four. See how he just did the he and we thing? That's his problem, not mine now. Uh, <laughs> we uh, needed two of our last four, and one was drivable, and he wanted three wood again. And I didn't want to go long, so I talked him into two iron, but he didn't hit a great two iron. It went into a bunker that was forty yard short, so now he's dead there. And um, just a couple things, but I don't know, like. Could another caddy, maybe another caddy wouldn't have helped him in a couple other spots. So I don't know. I, I mostly try to stay out of the way and just walk fast. But um, it's it's so much work. And it's nerve Such a hard job. It's such a yeah. hard job, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah, you have my no man, control. Yeah, my man used to do that. I'm Squirrel who caddied for me for a really long time. Yeah. Brilliant caddy. He used to, I'm convinced that I would never have any proof. He would never tell me. But he used to tell me the yardage to pick the club he wanted me to pick. Like you say, lying about the yardage, he absolutely would tell me a number. He, if he wanted me to hit seven, he would give me a number where I would never hit six. He would just right. give me a different number, so I would pick seven every time. Um, <laughs> and like you say, like one week, caddying for a guy for one week would be really difficult. If you caddy for a guy for years and years and years, you become one golfer. It's one organism, so you kind of know how to read putts for him and you know right. what he's thinking. You know, you, you could probably predict when you could predict when I was going to hit the wrong club just by my mood walking off the previous green, you know? <laughs> yes, 100%. Um, you know you're going to aim at the pin all of a sudden. It's a bad idea. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, tough job speaking, for one week. Speaking of Squirrel, uh, he's an all-time caddy. I only was around with him a couple of events. I think I played with him once. He had Luke Donald and, and Hilton Head, and he was great. But there is an absolutely, maybe a top five all-time story that he caddied for you, and he answered the phone on a tee box. Could you, uh, you want to tell that story? <laughs> <laughs> it is, I, it is unbelievable. It's mostly true. Um, <laughs> well, tell the, embellish it a little bit too to make it even yeah. better. <laughs> well, he tells it the best, especially after a bottle of red. But um, yeah. 10th at Riviera, we all know the hole. Um, and this is back when it was a 50-50 call. I mean, most guys had driver now or three would go for the green. But back then it was sort of, this is, I don't know, mid-2000s. Half the field would hit three or four iron, lay it up, and half the field would hit driver. And Squirrel was adamant, old school caddy, you lay it up. Ten at Riviera, you just lay it up. You three on at the bunker, wedge on the green. Three on at the bunker, wedge at the green. And like it was gradually over a few years because we play there every year. Gradually, I'm like driver. He's like no three on, and I was getting more and more and more like I wanted to go for the green. And finally, I doubled nine or something. Walk onto ten. I was like I'm hitting driver today. He goes no three on over there. I'm like no, I'm hitting driver. He goes well, you're wrong. It's a three on over there. So I'm like get out of the way. I'm hitting driver. Hit driver, make double. (laughs) <laughs> so we get onto the t- the eleventh tee, which is a really small, intimate little tee at Riviera. The cr- the, the crowd are on top of you. I mean, they can hear your whole conversations. A tiny little area, and um, this was back when we had like the Nokia. Well, everybody else had probably moved to Blackberries and iPhones, but he still had the old Nokia phone that had the crazy old school ringtone with the aerial. I think you pulled up when you were. Uh, when you answer the phone and it was ringing in his bag all the time. He wasn't putting it on silent. It was ringing all the time. But usually it was a practice round or you didn't really notice. This was in the tournament and his phone goes off right when I'm over the ball. Um, and, he, and he unzips the bag quietly as Squirrel would do and just gets it out and answers the phone. Hello, what? No, 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 sorry. I'm on the course. Uh, okay, bye. Hangs it up, puts it in the bag. And I just look straight at him with, I don't know, there's 100, 200 people standing there. I'm like, what are you doing answering the phone? Like, we're playing a golf tournament. What are you doing? He goes, oh, yeah. And who was that anyway? Who are you answering the phone to? 
He goes, that was my mum. She said, no one should hit driver on the 10th at Riviera. (laughs) 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 Uh, Just couldn't stop laughing. I mean, he just turned me from the most angry man to just a happy laughing man. It was incredible. Just what a moment. Yeah, and it's pretty much all true. So. Uh, well, just, th- thank I you for that. listening to Need a Fourth Podcast. We're going to conclude it now. You <laughs> right. can't, you can't <laughs> top that. I mean, this, this podcast is over. That's unbelievable. It's yeah, and the story's yeah. been going ever since. Uh, it's so good. <laughs> I love that one. Uh, all right. Well, t- take us inside the uh, the Max Homa uh, 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 baby shower because this this must have been one of the, the tour events, a social gathering of the season. Let's hear about it. It was, it was a pretty big time. Uh, so... Uh, he bought a new house recently. Um, it's nice, as you would imagine. Uh, and he was kind of one of the first parties he's kind of really had. I guess he's he typically goes off-site, out of house to party, I would say. But uh, a lot of people, um, kind of, I wouldn't say a who's who per se, but there was there were some heavy hitters there. And uh, just a great time. It was, it was a lot of young people, um, you know, kind of knew most of them. But uh, it's just, it was... He, he threw it himself, which is one of the cooler things that he threw the baby shower for his wife um, and made it a co-ed deal, which is a ton of fun. Um, hung out with Colt Nose there most of the time. Him, you know, you can hear story after story from that guy. Um, uh, it was it was just a lot of fun. There was uh, he had a bartender set up. So that was good. Plenty of food. He had a chef cooking and uh, we actually were like really well behaved for what kind of could have happened. We were only there for three or four hours. and. Um, I was home at eight o'clock uh, and uh, not too hung over today. So it was actually really fun. It was great. I mean, when you get a bunch of tour guys together, do you, do you wind up chipping in the backyard? Like how, how does that play out? It was one of those things. So yeah, we were, t- it was me, Colt, uh, Nost and Max in a group chat in the morning and Colt's like, Hey Joel, do you want to pregame this thing? And I'm like, sure. Uh, so we go out to lunch uh, with our wives or his, his soon to be wife. And, have some cocktails whatever we were kind of joking he's like are we gonna play beer pong at this thing and uh max just said yeah yeah but like later it's kind of a classy deal so i run to walmart and i grab a six foot footable table uh red solo cups beer pong balls and a case of beer and we show up a little bit later than most people and we walk into this thing with our table beer pong balls and the whole deal and we walk in immediately like the music stops. Everyone looks at us because we're slightly underdressed and we're carrying beer pong supplies. And he's like, Oh shit. Uh, guys put it in the garage. We can deal with this later. Cause we want to keep it classy for a while. So, um, we, we were going to turn that one up and kind of right about that time when it could have turned the corner. Uh, a lot of us probably realized it was a terrible idea. So we, we all kind of went home and all of that is still in his garage. So, uh, that we'll save it for next time. But, yeah, he's got a little chipping area back. He's got that stuff. We we just kind of sat inside. We watched the LSU Florida State game, which was great, and we watched the Kuros tennis match, which was fun. And um, just guys, you know, all the girls are on one. It was like middle school. The girls on one side talking about babies and their stuff, and all the guys are telling tall tales and and watching sports. PGA to a baby showers. I mean, how many baby showers have a bar? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you could tell Max is <laughs> definitely uh, thrown by a on the you know uh, of the husband, but. Uh, yeah, like my wife is having a baby shower uh, at the end of October, and she's like, "You have to leave for the day." And I'm like, "I have a day off Saturday. I'm home in the fall. Like it is. I'm gonna be nine o'clock kickoff. I'm gonna be ready to roll, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a day for sure." When Jeff, when you were when you were based in uh, in Scottsdale, did did your guys overlap a little bit? You you and Joel, did you have any? Uh, not really no i think uh no I, I made room for joel when i left yeah a little bit we played one practice round i kind of joined you for like five holes this actually was that week in 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 dc there uh in 18 um and i remember this comment i was like oh where do you live and you said arcadia at the time and i'm like oh i love arcadia like and that's actually where max just bought his place and that's like that's super nice it's not scottsdale it's like you don't feel like you're in Arizona. You don't feel like you're in desert. They have green grass, tall, big trees, awesome houses. And I was like, uh, cause we were kind of looking at actually buying a house at that time. It was our first house we we're going to buy. And I, I remember I was like, Oh, it's like, what are you kind of selling that one for type of a deal? And he mentioned the number and I was like, Oh, I need to win a couple of events and probably a major two to, uh, 
to, to, to live in Arcadia at the Ogilvy household for sure. So um, that's still our goal. We're actually building a house now in Scottsdale. Hopefully it's done by Christmas, but we were down there. And um, first thing my wife says, like, we got to live here someday. And I'm like, honey, we're, we're doing pretty good. But uh, this is like another level of to, to, to get what you can get in Scottsdale, to get what you can get in Arcadia is, is definitely another level. Jill, were, as a kid, were you one to watch golf on TV? Yeah, I, I watched quite a bit. Uh, something my dad and I did a ton, especially Saturday and Sunday. And we would go um, always play golf afterwards, live right by a golf course. And it was easy for us to, to go down and cruise around for an evening nine. So um, I remember, did Jeff, did you chip in on like 16 or 17 or 17, something? Really? Yeah, 17, yeah. Yeah. And for par, for par. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you hit a awesome drive on 18 and a good wedge shot or like a short iron in there. I remember that, but you weren't really talked about all day. You were kind of just kind of, you know, Monty, I know Mr. an iron shot in there and then obviously Phil's debacle. Uh, but I, I feel like no one was talking about Jeff. He wasn't really on TV as much. And then all of a sudden they showed him like the last like three holes and then he won. So I don't know. If yeah, I it was a bit of the Phil and Monty shot. It was a bit of the full yeah. Phil and Monty shot really. Uh, Which is, kind of nice for you i guess uh you can kind of not that you were i'm sure you're still feeling it but you probably felt like you were hiding a little bit yeah it didn't feel like that when we were there i mean um phil was not i mean that was the peak of phil in new york when i mean tiger's father just died that was his first miscut in a major That's i think right. wasn't it? wingfoot yeah um yeah. and so it was all that weekend was phil's chance right and they just new york they were they'd already put him up on the throne um so yeah it was good for me. It turned out good for me. It was a little bit like the PGA this year. You know, JT wasn't really in the mix at all. And then all of a sudden, yeah. a few holes to go. It's like, oh, JT's going to win. Like, that was, it was one of those sort of deals. Um, yeah. Crazy finish. Anyway, ancient history. <laughs> no, we, we love that stuff. Where, where's your trophy at now, Jeff? Uh, it's on the shelf. It's actually funny. Um, I, I had it up in Scottsdale in Arcadia for a bit. And then when we moved, it went into some boxes and I lost it for like two years. Um, Wow. When you move and you collect a whole lot of bunch of stuff, I mean, I didn't lose it. I knew I had it, but I didn't know where it was. It was in the boxes at the back of the storage unit somewhere. Um, and it's funny. Someone asked me about it. Don't you really care? And I'm like, well, kind of. I mean, I care that I won and it was a great experience and stuff. But if you, t- if you took it away from me, I wouldn't think any less of it. You know, I don't sit there every day and like look at trophies, you know. Um, it's funny. Winning it's the good winning it's the good part, not the piece of metal they give to you afterwards, you know. Fair. Well, don't you have to buy it too? It's like eight or ten thousand dollars to buy it or something. The replica. Yeah, it was like ten or eleven at that point. I think they're probably yeah. even more expensive now. Some guys uh, got the monopoly on making silver trophies for the major winners. Right. Which is just baffling to me. They give you a million or two dollars to win a tournament and they can't just throw you a replica. It's um Yeah, just take just take the ten K off the top from you and just give you the trophy yeah. and feel better. You know what Sean McKeel told me is the water maker, of course, is so big and the replica is even bigger and requires a lot of silver. And it was going to be the price of silver was really high back then or something. It's going to be like fifty thousand dollars. And so he never got the he never got the replica made. And, uh, and of course, he's uh, oh, no. on some hard times as a player. And uh, as of a few years ago, he still hadn't gotten it done. He was thinking, ah, it's now or never. I got I got to get one made. But yeah, I don't think people really, really understand. It always interests me because. As, as a player, as you know, nothing is guaranteed. You, you have a history. You won in 2021. You have some endorsements and some guaranteed money. But uh, how much do you worry about the future and project out two years, three years, five years? You're talking about kids and houses. Like, uh, How much stress is that on a guy like you who's making a very nice living, but you, you, you're not, you don't have the five-year exemption from a major and all these other things? Yeah, like I said, this is, I think I'm starting my seventh year, uh, which is kind of, beyond my wildest dreams really uh but yeah it's something that is always at the forefront so i had the two-year exemption from the win and teeing it up uh next week in napa like i playing for my job again i'm playing for my card um it's something that's we talk about all the time with my wife and uh i'm pretty confident in my game and i think i can hang around for a long time and i'm doing things to, to to better myself and and my game as well um but the talent is so good and people are coming up left and right. And I'm not a bomber and uh, sometimes can struggle on the greens. So like it doesn't take a whole lot to like get in a funk and not come out of it. Uh, I mean like Harry Higgs this year, like one of my good buddies, like he struggled really almost all of the, all the calendar season. Um, 
so you see like how quickly that can happen and um i think i play out of fear a lot like a fear of i have a fear of getting a real job uh i don't want to do that uh so i i sneaky practice more than uh people think i do and i do a lot of things to uh better myself as a golfer and uh because i know like especially with these elevated purses and what we have playing for like if I have a good five year run here, I can probably be set for life. And, um, my wife and I are pretty conservative with money. We invest wisely, uh, where we like to invest in real estate. We think it's pretty, um, I think it's a good long-term play. Uh, we don't fly private. We don't really spend a ton of money. So, uh, that is all so we can retire. We can take care of our future kids. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, it is a very real thing. Uh, I've, I've obviously had a, a solid run here, but, um, a quick injury, uh, a quick funk here or there, like it, it happens fast. So I'm I'm aware of that, but I'm also confident in who I am, I guess, as a golfer. I mean, when, when you see what happened to Will Zalatoris, does that send a little shudder down your spine? Uh, because that that's going to be one of the most expensive back injuries in golf history, right? He's number one on the FedEx Cup list, falls to 30th. Uh, who knows what, what he gave up or how long that will last? I mean, how, how does that land emotionally for, for a guy who's in the middle of his playing career? Yeah, I mean, you see a lot of the chatter on on social media stuff about, um, you know, oh, he could have taken the money and he'd be fine. Like you hope, like a, a you know, a back injury is always scary. Um, golfers get injured way more than than people think, and nagging stuff that that can, you know, kind of hang around it and, and linger. And so it's, yeah, like it it does it does worry me. Um, do we all have insurance? Yeah, but. It's nothing close to playing on tour, especially for Will, who's a world beater and is going to be one of the greats for a long time. Uh, yeah, you just hope that he can come back, uh, you know, and, and, and at least be the same, if not better. It's amazing, Joel, how many guys with your sort of profile can be real lifers just on the P- on the PJ Tour and then even on the senior tour. When you think about someone like a Paul Goidos or a Jay Haas or a Jim Furyk, um, who don't look like Tiger and don't look like Rory and don't look like Will Zalatoris, but just the way you described your life, I mean, it was such a combination of realism and optimism that every golfer needs. And I take my hat off to you, but I also know that there's something about that kind of personality type and that kind of physique and that kind of approach to the, to the game and to life that can make, it may not sound like that much, but Paul Goidos and Brad Faxon, for that matter, and a lot of other guys, they lasted a long, long time in this game. And it's hard, hard, hard to do. And, I mean, Jeff would know that far, far better than, than any of us. But uh, my, my take my hat off to you for the way you just described the, the balance in your life and how, you, and how you view your profession. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's something that uh, I guess I'm, I'm lucky. I, I understand I'm, I'm lucky and I'm very grateful to be on the PJ Tour. And I know how things can disappear quickly. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I have a trainer at home. I have a PT on the road. Like I do all of these things to take, take care of my body. I mean, John Daly famously said at one time, you can't pull fat. Um, like I, I don't have a beach body. I am not jacked. I'm not ripped, but it's something that I, well, I've talked with my coach about and it's like, Hey, you don't have any injury prone in your golf swing. Like you're going to be fine. And the way my body works and the way they chat with my trainer and like, we make sure that all of that stuff is still strong. So injury is not a huge deal for me. Um, but a kid like, I mean, Will swings it so fast and he's, he's so limber and he's got all this stuff, but that's, that's just part of the gig. Like, I mean, uh, I wouldn't say I'm on a pitch count either, but I don't have as many balls as a lot of other guys do either. And maybe, you know, I could be slightly better if I do, but, uh, I've, I have a young golf body, I would say, compared to for my age and, you know, compared to a lot of these other people. When you're young and you're just getting out there, all you want to do is find every little one percenter here and there. And I think so often guys will go off track when they just look for those little extra one percenters and go too hard. How many, how often do you see a guy change, come back from the off season with a changed body and he's now a vegan and he's like doing yoga every morning and stuff and he has a great three months and then two years later he doesn't have his card, you know. Um it happens all the time. I just think you've got to sort of play golf sincerely, not seriously. You know, you've got to be all in, but it's it's not your whole life. Just do what you do. And it's like every year I went through tour, the times when I struggled when I was reaching for more than me, 
you know. But if I just played golf and I was just Jeff, um, usually it was pretty good. And if I could go back and change anything, I wouldn't have taken it quite as seriously. As I said, sincerely is the right word. Be all in, but right. just play golf and learn how to have half a shot less a day, you know, and that's right. an extra million dollars at the end of the year. You know what I mean? Like you just don't need to chase it so hard. Uh, yeah. And you, you said it with two, so we – wife and I decided, I think three years ago to do a, uh, dry January. Uh, we're going to cut out alcohol, uh, and cut out sugars. So it was fine. A couple weeks I get Sony open and I'm playing okay, but Saturday hits and I, uh, I have like a sugar breakdown cause I'm used to having sugar and I, uh, and I literally like start like shaking and I'm like, what is going on? And I'm like, someone give me a Coke and a Snickers bar right now. Cause I am losing it. So I played like two holes as a mess. Finally got it. Like, and so that was, that was kind of a wake up for me of like, Hey, like you gotta, it's one thing to be healthy. I understand that, but it like, you have to kind of understand what makes you tick as well. So that same one still didn't drink, didn't do anything, uh, was healthy, but just made sure I was eating more of the golf course. And so we get to Pebble beach I think I'd missed every, I made the cut in Sony, but missed the other cuts. And it was Friday night of Pebble. I was playing poorly. I was frustrated. I was not happy. Called my coach with my wife and I'm like, Hey, like this sucks. He's like, Joel, you need to go to the bar and you need to go get drunk tonight. Cause you're going to miss this cut anyways, but go have a night and you can, you know, prep for LA after that. And my wife is like, what? This is your golf coach telling you to do this. So, uh, but Rob knows how he t- Rob played on the PJ tour for a couple years. He's played in us opens. Like this guy is awesome. And he knows me very well. And so go out and have cocktails that night. Have, make eight birdies at spyglass the next day and then play well on Sunday at, at Pebble. And I finished 12th, go to Riv. I'm one back of the lead on Sunday on 18th T uh, finished fifth. And then two weeks later, finished fifth at Bay Hill. And I was like, okay, like, there's a balance to all of this, but I have to be who I am. And, uh, I'm, if that means a couple of cocktails, uh, and eating sugar, then I'm going to do that. <laughs> I love that. But it also seems like you have a genuine love for, uh, for, for golf, which it's, some guys like to compete. Some guys like the, the rewards, but you just seem to love the game. I, I think about a couple of years ago, I was up at, at Band and Dunes and there was you and Gino and a couple of buddies at Sheep Ranch and we crossed paths. Yeah. It's actually one of the biggest regrets of my golfing life. I was one under on the first four holes, playing great. Saw you guys on the fifth tee, par three, a foozle the five iron about 30 <laughs> yards. Like, God damn it. Uh, Damon, you I, got my head. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do love golf. Like, I love playing with my friends. I love listening to music. I love playing fast. Like, if I hit the lottery, I don't know if I would play tour golf anymore. I don't know if I enjoy the travel that much. Um, but I would play golf nearly every day. I would join a couple different golf clubs around town and I would play all the time. Uh, I love play for a little bit of money. I'm like 50 to hundred bucks is great. Uh, a couple beers, music and play fast. Like I love golf. I love going to banded dunes. Um, I love all those things, but I love like hanging out with my friends and it affords me. I can play with my dad still. It's great. Um, I can play with a guy who's a 20 handicap and I can play with other pro golfers. Like it doesn't matter. And I think that's the great thing about golf and, is competing on tour fun? Yeah, uh, it's a blast. Like you know, when you're playing well, there's nothing really better than than, than being in the hunt on Sunday, and and you know, it affords me a great life. But the most fun I have sometimes is just playing with my buddies at home. Jill, how do you feel about having your wife out on the golf course? Is that something you like? Uh, I'm sure she wants to have her own identity as well. How do you, how do you balance that kind of thing? It's a good question. We've um, she's worked her entire life. She's worked since she was 14 years old. Um, She's just works hard. That's just, uh, and so when I got on tour as, you know, it was better if she traveled with me, kind of keeps me in line a little bit. Um, I, my life is better with her around. We're best friends. Uh, she's an incredible woman and we've developed a lot of great friendships on the road as well. So, uh, that was something, but also like she's Joel Damon's wife now. She's not Lana anymore. And so, um, we are, we're, we're due to have a kid in, in, in January. So that'll be fun. But, Something, you know, we kind of try to make sure that golf is in our life um, and especially for her. So I do better when she's on the road um, and we have a great time with it. She's she's a huge foodie. So we make sure we, you know, at, at all the fun restaurants around and, and do that stuff. But 
um, it is something that we've talked about. It's like, hey, do we like what what can we get you at home? Uh, you know, kind of like what what is your passion? So it's something we were always kind of balancing and trying to figure out. She doesn't want to be she's not a she's not a tour wife. You know, there's tour wives and then there's wives of golfers. Um, she's not a tour wife. I see Jeff smiling down there because he's <laughs> thinking. Uh, you guys all know there's many of them out there. So uh, we're lucky that we've we've got to meet some great couples that we're really close with. We spend a lot of time with, uh, share houses together and all that stuff. And um, very lucky to be able to do that. But and I'm lucky that my wife is not a tour wife. I mean, when I met her, uh, I was on the mini tours making negative money. She was working two jobs. She was working 16, 18 hours a day, five, six days a week to pay her bills and put food on the table, uh, but always supported me and, and, and pushed me. And she still kicks me in the butt quite a bit when I get a little lazy at times. And, you know, um, today we was clean out the closet day and that is a mess. So, uh, you know, she, she, she runs a pretty, she, she lets me have all the fun I want, but when it's time to, to buckle up, she, she makes sure that I'm, I'm in the right seat for sure. Yeah. Uh, it's more of an Instagram account, travel eats and treats. It's really fun. Uh, she just kind of takes pictures of, and it's not like we go to like, we don't go to fancy places all the time. We don't go always go to the best steakhouse. It's like, what do the locals eat? So we have spots now, obviously Sea Island's one of our favorites. Um, they have, you know, great stuff there. Uh, New Orleans is fun, but we, we try to go to like holes in the wall and, uh, you know, some, some, some dive gear places. Donna's drive-ins and dogs. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a lot more of that. And she's an incredible cook. So she cooks a lot at home. I'm spoiled there. And so we go out and eat some good food and she tries to, uh, you know, prep, prep that for when, when we're at home. It's the best and worst thing about playing on tour. I think is the food. You get to go out to restaurants every night. Um, like it's the best thing to go out and eat different food. And like you said, New Orleans yeah. and New York and Santa, Santa Monica is always a great week. Um, yeah. Great food, but then after a while, sometimes you go to some towns where it's Red Robin or Burger King, right? And like, can't over this. Let's just go. We we started rent a lot of houses the last couple of years so we can cook at home as well. We choose, you know, there's two or three spots we'll eat at, and then make sure we eat at home as well because, you know, you go stretch for three or four weeks in hotel rooms and you're not getting a home cooked meal, and that makes me like that's the part I struggle with a lot. So rent houses with other golfers and and try to make sure we 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 have some good meals at home as well. I was talking to Pat Perez um, at the live event in Portland and he was talking about all the ways they take care of the players. He's like, and, and all the food, man. I said, what? I've been in player dining. They, they feed you guys so much out on tour. He's like, yeah, but, but only breakfast and lunch. We get dinner out here. I was like, Oh geez. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's what you need, Pat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was serious. He was dead serious. I was like, wow. Okay. I mean, sure. I will say that the travelers event is one of the best events on tour and Thursday night, uh, they do an awesome, huge dinner that all the families and the kids are out back playing wiffle ball and all those things. But like people talk like that dinner on Thursday night is one of the best. It's kind of, it's awesome. All the food you could possibly want. Um, and people talk about that. Like that's a big thing for players on tours. And it's kind of funny how that works. Uh, it is nice to come off the round when you finish late and you get to just walk into the clubhouse and eat dinner real quick. And then, cause you have a quick turnaround for the morning. Uh, so it's kind of funny how us golfers um, can can need or want certain things that don't seem like that big of a deal, but they're kind of a big deal kind of in the whole overall spectrum. Joe, what is your mindset when you're driving to the golf course and you know you're going to be playing with a guy, and I'm not asking you, of course, to name names, but you're going to play with a guy that you really just don't like? How do you, how do you get, wrap your mind around the idea that, well, I'm going to be with this guy for five hours, especially on a Thursday and Friday? Yeah, we had one recently this summer that uh, wasn't great, and we knew it was going to suck. And but we're both playing well. It was in a bigger event, and uh, kind of when the pairings came out, like Gino that night, I'm like, "Hey, Gino, come prep with stories. It's we know it's me and you only tomorrow, and uh, like, give you know, be be ready for for extra story time, and uh, you're almost just gonna like." I don't know. It's more like me against him type of a deal or me, you know, whoever that competitor is. But I, that's where I'm super lucky that my best friend is also my caddy. Like sometimes those days are more fun. Like you continue, I don't know, just the stories we get to tell each other. And, you know, you have, like you said, four or five hours out there together of not chatting with the other human. Um, it's, it's almost fun at times because it happens so rarely now. I'm pretty friendly with most people and, 
Uh, but there's always a couple, you know, it's just not going to be that much fun. So that's where I'm lucky that, that the Geno's there for me. Don't don't say the other player's name, but if you if you whisper, only me and, and my friends <laughs> hear it. <laughs> you, no. guys it probably, you guys probably you guys probably doesn't matter who it is. A couple of them, yeah. Some guys just get under your skin, right? Some it's like just just the way they are. You know, you've had an incident somewhere, or uh, didn't carry the water hazard and dropped it too far up, or something. Um, you know, you have incidents and stuff that happen. You just it's kind of fun watching guys squirm. I think sometimes, sometimes it's fun to make the guy who makes you uncomfortable, uncomfortable, um, make it a challenge, you know? Yeah. I kind of started going that route a little bit more. I despise slow play, like slow play. I understand there's, there's a slow play problem on tour, but mostly it's just the fields are too big. Like you just can't, there's just too many people on the golf course. Like there's going to be road, you know, traffic jams out there, but like slow play. And sometimes I'll, I'll do the extra slow play for a couple holes just to make sure we get behind because it's not an issue for me. And so uh, I like to watch those guys have to, when the rules fisher pulls up, I'm like, yes, let's go. I can finally be in my routine now. And uh, you guys get to squirm a bit. <laughs> well, this is good inside baseball. So how do you play extra slow? Oh, I'll go to the bathroom randomly and take a while and I'll like grab a water after people hit and like mess around in there. And then, I'll walk slower and uh, I'll pretend like I didn't know I was away. That's a fun one because now I get to go through my full <laughs> routine uh, and be like, oh, I didn't know. Like, oh, it was you, me. And so that's that was always just those things add up. And uh, sometimes, I, uh, you know, if you mark like a one foot putt, that really pisses people off. So uh, sometimes I'll, I'll get in that mode and just mark everything. Um and to watch but people this is what slow players do naturally like you actually have to work at it and plan this out to go slow this is what they do right that's exactly. how they're slow <laughs> it's unbelievable to me like i think gino's one of the quicker caddies but he's i, I don't understand like how like i just don't understand like you get a number it takes like everyone says a range fighter is going to help speed of play there's no chance range fighter speed of play because you're either well gino can get a number and 10 seconds at most. And now we know it's between two clubs and you're probably only going to hit one of them 98% of the time anyway. So there's not a whole lot. Obviously if it's a windy par three or something like I get there's times that, but we call them time suckers. So they suck all of your time. And then all of a sudden now you guys are on the clock where you guys are behind and now I have a tough tee shot coming up or a tough shot. And I need the extra 30 seconds all of a sudden, but they sucked all that time out earlier in the round. So now I don't have time when I've been playing twice as fast as him all day. That's the part that's frustrating at times. I always felt like slow play should be uh, an issue that the players hand out the penalties. There, there should be a tribunal of current players. And it would there's, there's got to be a way, because you, you guys know instinctively, and you, you, at the end of the round, you could point to seven different times that this person slowed you down. The rules official is never going to be there for all 18 holes. Like It seems like there should be some frontier justice where – uh, the players could actually <laughs> assess the penalties and that would, that would have a monumental effect, right? Like, uh, you know, we'd have to work yeah. out some of the details, but I think that, that would be amazing. <laughs> I think that we should post like the slow players in the locker room. I think that there's, there could be something to that. I know that they say like the best, you know, p- p- we, we, we should police ourselves better. We should call out the slow players, but we're golfers. We're not confrontational. Like there's not a single human out there that I know that is confrontational. Like we're all in our own world. We kind of, but no one's going to step up and be like, Hey, you're playing slow speed up. It's like, you just kind of wait for the rules official to do it at the time. So I don't know. There's, it's, it's not there's, in your best interest to, to get into it with a player because then you're all stressed for the rest of the day. That's like, exactly it. Yeah. You know, like it's, you're trying to take care of yourself and, you know, play your best and it's not good if your heart rate gets up because you call someone else out. That's just never a good end game for anything. So uh, the solution is less players on the golf course. That's why you can play in three and a half hours at Colonial on Saturday and Sunday because there's just less players and it doesn't take much time. So, but um, when you have a 156 man field, it's just going to be slow. We should pay the fastest players. They should be, they should be like inside the pip. There should be on the shot link numbers, there should be the fastest players get bonus money down to the top 10 and the most improved from last year's numbers should Ooh. get paid. Most improved is of- good because some guys do improve and they work at it. And that is like, hey, thank you. Like you saw a problem and you fixed it. 
I like that idea. That's a great. That's a great. Instead good of job. punish slow play, let's reward fast play. You know, because yeah. so many, I mean, these guys all go home. I mean, Joel says he loves golf at home. You play with tour players at home. They run around. They don't warm up. They they all shoot sixty five, taking two hours and forty five minutes. They just walk up and hit it, and they yes. all go low, and they play better. Every single one of them. As soon as it comes to Thursday, it's just two and a half minutes a shot. Can't decide on the club. Like you've been playing golf your whole life. You're really good at it. 180 is a seven iron and it's always been a seven iron. Just hit a seven iron. Like, what do you mean? Yes, yes. Like, it's just crazy. You're exactly right. I mean, you played at Whisper Rock a lot. I mean, yeah, you'd show up, you grab a cocktail, you hit three balls and maybe two putts and you're on the tee and you rip one down the middle and no one ever is like, oh, I didn't get to warm up today. I'm like, and then it's a two hour routine to get ready for the Thursday morning. And you're like, I don't, I don't understand it. Yeah, it's crazy. Well, when you said that no one's confrontational, because all the assholes went to the live tour. But I, I, those are my uh, words, not most. Joel's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most. <laughs> most. There's most. a couple others we could send over there. Um, this is something I'm just curious how, how different your answers will be. Because um, you're the two, Jeff and Joel, you're the two guys on this podcast who can really play golf. Like w- when you're standing over a ball, and of course, there's always a million variables in a tournament situation, whatever. But what what sensation are you trying to create in your body? Like, what is the feel you're looking for? I'm really, I've always been curious about that. <laughs> wow. We're not going to uh, tell you it's a secret. <laughs> I'm trying to black out. Uh, I'm trying to not do, I'm, I'm a, nat, I'm more of a feel player anyways, but like, I'm a, like a one swing thought and go type guy. And Sometimes when I'm playing my best, if you ask a lot of players, what were you thinking about? They're like, oh, I wasn't, I was reacting to a target type thing, which is kind of a cliche answer. But, um, I, I don't know. You're that's, it's, it's the biggest problem with golf, right? It's the biggest problem with golf is like you, you ask, everyone asks good players, well, what were you doing when you do it? And then they describe it, but they weren't thinking of that when they were doing it. They were just doing it. You can't, and how do you describe a feel in words? Like words aren't appropriate to describe a feel. You can't describe what your golf swing feels like or Brad Faxon can't describe what his putting stroke feels like. I don't know. It just feels like I'm rolling the ball over there. Right. You know, we're looking for what he's doing, but he's just putting. To him, it's just putting. Right. Um, and, I mean, there's books and websites and blogs and videos and sports scientists all trying to break down what we do in a golf swing, but really the people who know how they do it, they just walk up and hit it you know, and everyone cuts it up in pieces later on. It's just an impossible thing to do to describe what you feel. You know, we just play a lot and we just weren't look at how do you, what do you feel when you throw a ball to someone? You know, you just throw a ball, right? You aim at the glove and you just throw a ball. What are you feeling? What muscle sequence do you use when you throw a ball? You know? And it's amazing how often your feel is not real. Now we have all the technology, we have all the track mans and all the other stuff. And it's like, oh, I feel like I'm swinging right and it's still too left. And it's like, well, so if I tell someone I feel like I'm swinging right, but it's not actually what's going on, like that doesn't match up at all. And uh, I mean, famously, like the ball flight laws, right? Like Nicholas and Palmer and all those guys had it absolutely backwards. Like they said they close the club face or they point the club face where they want it to go and they swing, you know, out or, you know, for a draw and a fade. I'm like, that's absolutely opposite of how you do that. But I was even young. I was old enough or to, I was taught to hit a fade by pointing your club at the target and then swinging left. Where really that's not how it works at all. So uh, it's kind of amazing how feels aren't real. So uh, and every, you just kind of trust whatever your feel is that day or whatever it could be. And you just kind of roll with it. To, to the point you guys are making uh, at the open this Joel, Ch- did you play in the open at, at St. Andrews this year? Uh, I missed out. That's one of that's. I, I think I'm going to have another chance before I'm too old, but that was one of my – that's going to burn me not to play in the 150th at St. Andrews. Well, I hope you get another chance. I'm sure you will. But uh, one, one of the – and Alan knows this because we've talked about it, but um, one of the highlights for me was that Ch- Chervino was there, of course, as a former uh, open champion. And, of course, all the guys who are on the range – Brian Harmon and John Rump, way, way, way too young to even know the highlight reel of Lee Trevino. They just know that Lee Trevino is golf. And and Brian Harmon particularly was really watching him closely. And afterwards, I talked to him and said, what'd you pick up on there? And he said, just like how much he feels golf and how mechanical I can get. And I don't consider Brian Harmon a mechanical golfer at all. But uh, it was just interesting to hear him 
gravitate to Trevino without necessarily even really understanding what Trevino is all about. But still, you could tell, you know, for me, Seve was that way. Steed was that way before that. Uh, so it's interesting that how we're, how we're drawn to these golfers that Payne Stewart was that way, uh, who have what, uh, what, what Jeff is describing, just have it. They can't right. really, and don't really want to even want to want to talk about it. Can I change the subject here for one second? Cause we won't have Joel and won't have this opportunity with Joel all that often. Joel, I, I find Jay Monahan when I'm in his physical presence, he, you know, just the eyes alone are very impressive. Uh, He's intense. You know, he's got that New England bulldog quality about him. Uh, but you've seen him uh, behind closed doors a lot, lot more than, than certainly Alan and I have. Um, how is he different behind closed doors than the, uh, than the Jay Monahan we see in press conferences? Uh, I think Jay's a rock star. Uh, he's, he's quick with a joke behind closed doors. He's, uh, he's open. I would say he's, he's, he knows so much about each player. Like he asked about how my wife is doing and um, asked how my dog's doing. And um, uh, he, he got to watch. Uh, so I'm on the Netflix show that's coming out next year. And uh, he got to watch kind of a, I guess a, a rough cut of it, of, of one of my episodes, I guess, or, uh, and he said such a nice note uh, about that. Like he's, he's, I think he's just the best. Like he, uh, you could argue the business side and the politics. I don't really get into that much. I don't know. I'm not smart enough to figure it all out. So I think he is. And the people that do all that stuff are fine. I think Rory's doing a good job. I'll let him talk. But uh, I, Jay's always been super personable. Uh, I've got to go to a couple dinners with him. Um, but he's he's easy with a smile and, and typically a pretty good joke. And he is very aware and locked into to what's going on with a Almost all the players. I've I've been impressed with that part. Joel, you're on the player advisory council, right? Like you got to know Correct. some of this stuff. <laughs> you, can't, you can't totally punt on all the politics and the deal making. That like that's your purview, man. Your your leadership. Uh, I am not. Uh, the board is the leadership, and I am just the guy who sits in the room. Jeff, were you ever on the pack? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So it's like, just, yeah, it's fun, and you're not really part of it. You just. Yeah, you around just, ideas to throw upstairs, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Like it's I I pressed pretty hard for three years to be on the pack because I thought if I'm going to be on tour, I want to know how the business works. Uh, this is my job, and I feel like a, I should just know what's going on. And maybe I don't know if I've ever had this grandiose idea of what should be going on, or maybe how to make it better. I just want to understand it better. And I kind of get in the room, and it doesn't matter at all what I say or what I think, which is fine. But it's kind of fun to be in the room, and when when people start talking and uh, there's some guys that are extra fun to listen to at times. And uh, we get to poke fun of them after the meeting's over. <laughs> uh, just, okay. Don't, don't say their names. You're, you're discreet, but just give us their initials. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I don't have enough to heal in me yet. <laughs> Dang. Uh, so I become friendly with uh, Chad Mom. He's the the Vox Media executive who's overseeing the Netflix show, and mm -hmm. uh, he's been telling me all year like people are going to lose their minds when they see this. Um, and I guess I'm a little dubious because I know I know I've seen tour players a lot through the years and and their their uh, habits. But what is what about this show is is going to be eye opening to the fans at home? And how in your situation in particular, how, how open have you been? And then how comfortable have you gotten having the cameras invade your life? Uh, I would say that I've been very open, probably to a fault. Uh, I mean, my wife and I, we hosted a huge party Tuesday night. We call it Taco Tuesday. We've done it for years here for the Phoenix Open. But this year was kind of a blowout. I mean, we had 70 plus people here and bartender and all the stuff going. So that was kind of the, the, the first step. But They've been to our house three times now. Like they've sat down my wife separate multiple times. So we've we've been very open to it. But why well, don't I? We're pretty open. I mean, we're we don't have anything to hide, and we are pretty normal people. I'd say comparatively to a lot of tour players, uh, we live a pretty normal lifestyle outside of hitting a golf ball and traveling a lot. So I think people are going to be surprised at one how boring most tour players are. <laughs> uh, like, oh, what do they do at home? It's got to be so much fun. I'm like. No, it's really not. Like you kind of wake up, go to the gym, go play some golf, and that's it. Like there is, 
And there's not, I think they wanted this drama and I haven't watched a lot of that F1 uh, drive to survive stuff, but I, there's always like, sounds like they're always kind of like fighting amongst teams and there's always some drama going on. And um, there's just really not that on the PGA tour. I know this year's, you know, special with the live and, and the stuff going on back and forth, but I just think, I think they're going to love like hearing some, some comments and like what they always like, Oh, what are the players talking about on the golf course? Uh, where you stay, what you eat and like, like simple things. So I think they're going to be, I don't, I don't have, they've, they've been very, the Netflix people have been very, very quiet about how this is all going to me. They haven't like, Hey, they don't really show you snippets. They don't, they just say, yeah, you guys are doing great. I heard Kepka is unbelievable on it. Um, I don't know if he let him into some of his grandiose things, but um, I've heard he's going to be great. And I've heard that there's others that are like duds. So I don't know how it's all going to shape out. I think they're just going to be surprised with some the behind the scenes stuff, um, which is like in the locker room. They'll just kind of be like, we're just typical people. Um, we're just dudes like who play golf. And we talk about the same stuff that, everyone else talks about. And um, so I, my understanding is they're not out to get anyone. They're not out to, you know, show a bad side of necessarily anyone. So you're probably gonna get the best of all of it. Um, But I'm kind of just as curious and kind of excited to see how this all unfolds. What would be an example of Brooks Kepa going grandiose? I don't even know. I played with him one time and he was super nice to me, but I imagine that uh, I have, I've heard, so we've all heard stories. So, uh, I heard, uh, he likes Vegas. I've heard, uh, he likes to have a good time at home as well. So, but I mean, everyone likes to drink a beer and hang out. So I don't know exactly what that means, but I've heard that he let them in to his life quite a bit at home, which I guess I'm just excited to see as anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have heard, you know, cause the, they needed, they needed a one bad guy, one live bad guy who just took the money. And it, was, it wasn't for any, you know, noble reasons, just completely sold his soul. So maybe it's Brooks, maybe it's somebody else. We'll see. But that'll, that'll add a little spice to it, perhaps. It's all in the editing, right? But they, yeah. there's so, they have so much content. I can't imagine, like, what is left on the, the floor, like the editing floor. Like, you know, they shoot, someone would smarter than me knows, but I don't, they shoot hours and hours to get, like, a minute that's going to be on the actual TV show. So I don't know how that's all going to work out. but. Um, I think I'm going to be able to lay my head on the pillow at night and be like, I was who I was. And, um, I'd be curious what my wife said. She's, she's pretty real at times. So, uh, I'm, I try to cover up a couple things every now and then, <laughs> but also Gino's been mic'd up for multiple rounds. And so the stuff you can edit, you could edit it both ways, like super quickly on, if you don't, if there's not a previous conversation, all of a sudden he circles back something. He just talks about it, like that could be totally out of context, which is a really fun way to get out of things. Oh, I was taken out of context, but um, I'm, I'm hoping that they paint us in the best light that they can. Yeah. Well, and I think people, anyone who follows golf even casually at this point knows that you and Gino are, are thick as thieves. And uh, if there's any bickering or trash talking amongst you, it's you're going to survive it. It's, it's not really. Personal. Oh yeah. There won't be anything uh, between us. I think it'll be mostly him probably making fun of me for hitting bad golf shots uh, or yeah. me. Um, yeah. Telling him he was wrong. That happens a lot. <laughs> That's great. Well, um, you've been extremely generous with your time, Joel. Uh, before, before we let him go, do you guys have any, any final thoughts or final questions? Very, very enjoyable. Joel, I've, I've, I've known you to be, you know, a highly intelligent, insightful uh, player. And uh, I've admired you from afar and I'll say hi in person the next time I see you. But I didn't know that was such a famous thing. I'm sorry that I brought it up. Uh, Had I known that, I I wouldn't have. But I I remember being very... uh, I'm sure Alan uh, was like, oh, Bearbaker, everybody knows that thing. What are you... (laughs) That's not obscure. No. Uh, (laughs) Anyway... Uh, I'll just, I'll just, there's one quick observation. Uh, you all talked about tribunals in different ways. I had a, a friend who died last year. He's a great guy named Michael M. Thomas. He was a longtime member at National Golf Links. And his thing was, you're, this, this follows from your discussion of slow play and 
who should get rewarded and who should get penalized. His thing was that every golf club should have a reverse admissions committee and someone is going to get thrown out of the club every year for merit or not. And I thought that was a good idea. Keep people on their toes. And what you said, <laughs> what you said, Joel, about fear, uh, fear is some motivator in life and uh, it's valuable. So keep being scared. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah. All right. On that note, um, we're going to let you go, Joel. Part of our, our little podcast sneakiness is you hit the leave button and then we're going to we're going to Monday morning quarterback your your appearance Love it. and have a little fun. We so, get to talk about you. Yeah. But thank you for your time. This was, this was well, great. Really. Appreciate yeah. It. Thank you, guys. This is fun. I, I like this format. This is a lot of fun. Uh, I think you guys have something here that's, you know, there's a million podcasts out there, but this one's uh, well, the three of you are, are I'd say pretty, pretty special in your guys' field. So. Uh, it's it's kind of fun that uh, you know you have a surprise guest and you have no idea what's coming or or where where it's going to go. Good stuff. Thanks, Joel. Take care. You have to press the lead button, Joel. It's the red oh, one. Oh, like I was going to hang around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that was great. I mean, clearly one of the good guys, right? I don't know anyone in golf who doesn't like Joel Damon. Oh, fantastic. What a guy. And smart, thinks about golf, um, thinks about the tour. It's not getting carried away with not getting carried away with his results or thing. He just loves playing golf on tour and he wants to keep doing it. That's just really the sort of guy who will play, like you said, the David Toms or the Brad Fax and he looks he seems like he could be the guy who's out there for thirty or forty years, the Jerry Kelly, you know. Um keeps it all in balance. And I, I would, from the little I know about his game, uh, looks like a guy who could you get you get him on. A, if there was ever a U.S. Open on a tree line golf course again, that may never happen. He'd be a good guy. You know, he looks like he's out of the Jeff Ogilvy, Scott Simpson, Larry Nelson tradition of you know keep the ball in front of you, play smart shots, go for it when you can. Middle of the green on par five, second shot. You know, two putt birdies are great. Uh, Seventy is great. And I could see this guy contending in the U.S. Open. Yeah, he, he played great at Brookline. So uh, I don't think – and that's about as traditional as it gets. So I think – That was a neat there. setup. Not to segue, but that was neat. That was neat. Yeah, no, it's – there's – and you know this better than anybody, Jeff. Like guys get to tour and and a lot of them just sort of turn into a different person, right? But like I think part of what makes Joel appealing is just the same guy he was seven years ago when he was – or ten years ago, when he was struggling on the on the Canadian tour, and uh, it's refreshing that even if somebody has success, they stay exactly the same because that 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 seems in, in any walk of life that seems a little rare. Oh, look, I'm sure it happens everywhere, but on tour, absolutely. Uh, the measure of the guy is when he plays really well for a period, and when he plays really poorly for a period, like how they are. You know, some guys' um, personalities and. Uh, perspectives on things change depending on where they are on the money list and he seems to be a guy who's gonna be the same every day which is what you're really looking for you know in a in the locker room you know you're going to gravitate towards those guys who are consistent they're really good guys they're not getting carried away with what they are they know that in two months time they might be missing every cut you know i mean it's such a a ethereal fleeting thing uh form when you play golf um and he seems to have that own perspective so yeah good value I hope he stays out there as long as he can. Yeah, here, here. Jeff, have you ever played with uh, Bill Murray or been around Bill Murray? I've been around Bill. Thank goodness I haven't played with him, um, <laughs> well, at least in the tournament, because I think that's a fair distraction. I mean, DA did an unbelievable job playing with him for so long because I think it's a circus. But a few, yeah, a few of the events at the tournament over the years, he's um, – He's an interesting character. The, the reason I bring the reason I bring him up, one of his things is you're going along in your career, and then you hit it big, very quickly. And, he, and and Bill Murray says you're gonna be a dick for a year. That goes without saying. The question is what happens at, on the one year anniversary. That's really the measure of the man. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, I love that. Best. All right. Well, on that note, we're gonna end another. Uh, Nita Fourth, uh, thank you for listening. Of course, uh, Jeff Ogilvy, Michael Bamberger, I'm Alan Shipnuck. Uh, it's this is a fun little thing we have going here, and we appreciate your support. So we will be back in your ear with another episode soon. Uh, but that's all we got. Uh, wishing Joel Damon happy trails. We appreciate his time, and uh, 
we'll try it. We'll, we'll try and top it. It's going to be hard to get a more thoughtful guest, but that's our goal. Every try and get every episode better than the one before it. I don't know if that's possible, but we'll do our best. So thanks for listening. Uh, that's all. <laughs>